Sure. Well, we have some superstars from Morpsey with us today, um, and they are going to talk to us a little bit about uh, rapid speed transportation initiatives, and this includes Hyperloop, which we have had multiple discussions with, and I, too, believe, believe it will be uh, rail uh, possibilities and where they are in um, working through that. I see we have Neil with us. We, we have got the, we've got the whole A team here, um, so take it away. All right. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor Grooms, uh, and City Manager McDaniel, and members of the, the Council. Uh, I'm Thea Walsh. I'm the Transportation Director with the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. Um, I'm here uh, tonight to share with you, um, uh, Dina, too, uh, to share with you the Rapid Speed Transportation Initiative up update. And I couldn't think of a more fitting place to do that, but where yesterday meets tomorrow. There you go. So <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Um, so a little back background on the project. Um, we, uh, so we had been studying a rail line, a passenger rail line connecting Chicago to Columbus back in 2013. We saw this opportunity to go after um, a uh, international competition they were doing for, uh, at the time, Virgin, well, Hyperloop One, now Virgin Hyperloop One, uh, for their new technology. Um, we submitted into that competition um, amongst 2,600 applicants from around the world. We were picked as one of the 10 that they wanted to move forward with um, in the world. Um, and since then, we've um, embarked on a study to see the feasibility of both Hyperloop and continue the, feasibil uh, continue the environmental assessment for uh, the passenger rail component um, with the great assistance of the city of Dublin. So thank you for that assistance. Um, and since that time, we have also, you've joined us on a trip to DevLoop out in the Nevada desert where they have been testing this, uh, the, the Hyperloop uh, technology. Um, the pod visited us this summer at the library. That was an awesome venue and an awesome event. Thank you for that. Um, and now we're on the cusp of what is known as the International Hyperloop Certification Center competition. Um, the governor has received a letter um, seeking a site for their final certification site, and uh, we look to be um, high on their list in that competition. So uh, I want to introduce you to the lead for the project, uh, Dina Lopez, who's managed this project through, since the very first proposal. And she's going to go over with you uh, some of the findings we've found so far and um, tell you what, where we're headed next. Thanks, Dina. Thanks, Thea. Good evening. Good evening. Like Thea mentioned, my name is Dina Lopez, and I am uh, the Strategic Projects Manager at the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, and I have the joy of taking care of this fun little project. So today, um, I, the purpose of today is mostly this is we, we consider our uh, public official debriefs. We have now concluded uh, getting all, doing all the analysis and have the key findings of both studies from both consultants. So it's at, it, it is at this point in which we come back to you, the study funders and, and the public officials that are you know, helping us pursue this project, to share with you those key findings first and, and then just also incorporate uh, your input or any questions that you may have at this point. Uh, and then we also want to discuss those next steps after we conclude the two studies that we've started with this particular initiative. So what is RSTI? RSTI stands for the Rapid Speed Transportation Initiative. And what we wanted to focus at Morpsey and with our members was on not so much the type of mode, but on finding better, faster connections between Chicago and Columbus and Columbus and Pittsburgh. So if you take it back and you remove any type of mode preference and you just think about mass transportation in our city and how we connect to one of our biggest, closest cities, which is Chicago, our modes that we have are not very efficient. So we need a mass transportation mode aside from the airplane. And with that in mind, we started looking at passenger rail in 2013 with the support of many cities in central Columbus, in central Ohio. Um, and uh, whoops, there. Um, and, and then we, uh, once we decided that we were going to be looking at these two modes, uh, we launched two studies an environmental study that starts to collect all of those environmental uh, components and analyses that you need in order to get an environmental approval or the NEPA approval from federal government. 
Uh, and we also wanted to do a feasibility study where we dove a little bit deeper into Hyperloop, what it is, what it could do for our economies, what it could do in, in the way that we move. Imagine the automobile and the impact that had and how a trip from Lancaster to Ohio was a yearly thing back in the day when you did it in horse and buggy. Now we don't even blink an eye. So we can't even imagine what this type of mode, this type of transportation could do to a region, particularly central Ohio. So for the Hyperloop feasibility, we wanted to look at um, identifying routes. First of all, is it feasible? Because in order for it to be feasible, it has to be able to attain uh, optimal speeds. And what we found to be optimal speeds would have to be above 450 miles an hour or higher. So we needed to look at these corridors and look at possibilities of different types of right-of-way with that in mind. Is it possible to do it on this particular route and still attain those speeds to make it worthwhile? We also wanted to understand um, what it could mean to freight. Central Ohio is known for its logistics and its freight movements. So this technology could mean yet another added layer of, of, of attraction for employers in the logistics and freight industry. So that was another big thing that got us the attention of the Ohio Department of Transportation and FHWA, Federal Highway Administration, because they wanted to see and understand better, do more analysis of how this would impact our economies. So, like Thea mentioned before, uh, we have been looking at mass modes of transportation between Columbus and Chicago since 2013. So the first thing to do was to continue on that effort. We have developed very good relationships along the corridor from M metropolitan planning organizations like MORPSI to uh, jurisdictions like City of Lima and City of Fort Wayne to counties. They all entered into memorandums of agreement to explore passenger rail between Columbus and Chicago and the communities along the way. So we already had this framework in place. We had these relationships, this trust built with partners across these different states. So we, we approached them about Hyperloop and they were very excited about the possibility. So there we go. Here we had another potential mode that we were looking at. So this map here shows the lines that the consultants looked at four potential rail routes, passenger rail routes between Columbus, Chicago, and Columbus and Pittsburgh. Now these are all existing rail right of way. Some portions are no longer active, but for the most part they're all active railroad and they're all being used by freight uh, railroad companies. And uh, the one thing that we wanted to, to make sure is that we were looking at alternatives that would not incur super huge costs in terms of investments to make, you know, like creating new right of way, for instance, for rail. So uh, at this time, our alternatives were focused on existing rail right of ways. So the blue line is the result of looking at many, many options in terms of where a Hyperloop route could go. Now, because of the technology, things like curvature, things like, you know, elevation changes, we, did, we couldn't have something that would navigate too much up and down or too much sideway, you know, if that makes sense. You needed something that would remain somewhat straight. So these were the best alternatives. And of course, one of the things that we have been asked uh, quite a bit is, well, is it going to be a lot, how much of it is going in the rail right of way? Because we were trying to find ways to have it um, be also in the rail right of way so you, we didn't have to go get more right, rail right of way. So the orange highlights on the screen show you the portions that are rail right of way shared with the Hyperloop route. And the blue would be all uh, new right of way that would need to be acquired. Some of it does, has the possibility of going on existing roadways. So, you know, we, this is just again a very high level study. We look at feasibility of route. The actual uh, detailed design and engineering would, would really hone in on right of way type of needs. But this is just to give you the big picture of what those two potential routes could look like. So one of the questions that I've been asked by, other, by the public is, you know, what, why another travel alternative? Uh, to those of us in transportation, we know these, we can recite them in our sleep. Uh, it is a safety thing, first and foremost. You know, we do have quite a lot of casualties and injuries on the roadways from single occupancy vehicles. One of the things that we found in this study is that a majority of travel between Columbus and Chicago happens by single automobile. Single automobile. So you're having like single cars driving back and forth that increases your chances of, of injury and of accidents. So that was one component that we had very, very much in mind as we looked at why we were looking at mass modes and passenger rail and Hyperloop. 
We also know that we're, with the incident, inclement weather and more on reliability in terms of weather, uh, types of weather that we get, Hyperloop is a contained environment. So it, like storms and, and flooding and different types of weather events uh, would not affect it or delay it the way that it does with rail or trucks. So this was another thing that also made it very, it, it, it met that purpose and that need as we went through the criteria of determining why this is something that we wanted to pursue. Uh, we also know that there's a limited space in, 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 uh, in terms of how much more lanes and, and highways we can build. And we also know that with the increasing uh, younger you know, populations in our region, millennials want more choices. They want to be able to uh, have other alternatives aside from single occupancy vehicles to travel between cities and within their region. Uh, we also looked at it from the perspective of economic development. Uh, many of you have heard of the concepts of transit-oriented development, and Hyperloop would be no different. This is a, a mode and a type of, of transportation that any station or portal, as they're called in Hyperloop world, would incentivize quite a bit of different types of mixed development, the kind of thing that a lot of economic developers really try to attract to their regions. So from that perspective alone, for the cities themselves, it would be a great opportunity, but imagine the communities along the way that could have these portals or passenger rail stations as well. Uh, and, and the type of economic um, development that could happen around them. So for passenger rail, what we looked at were those particular rail right-of-ways uh, could sustain up to 110 miles an hour speeds for trains. Now this is again, uh, again um, provided that the uh, appropriate investments and improvements are made to the rail right-of-way, and this would be done as fun funding allows. Uh, you know, the, the, the type of trains would be elect electronic locomotives and, um, you know, the train cars that could be added on demand depending on, on capacity and on need. So in terms of Hyperloop, this is a little bit different. Uh, like I mentioned before, it is in a low pressure tube, so it is a contained environment inside. It uh, works by electromagnetic propulsion. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it's basically the next generation of magnetic levitation technology. It is autonomously controlled and uh, it, it is on demand. So this is where it becomes very different. This is a system that is on demand. It, it transports in, uh, in, in um, uh, the, the mode itself has smaller amount, a smaller amount of people that can move through it, uh, and smaller amount of cargo, but it can ha move faster and more frequently because it is on demand. Uh, you don't have to stop station to station. So uh, if Dana and I were going from Columbus to Chicago, I'm going to Chicago, he's going to Lima or Fort Wayne, we don't get on the same pods at the station. We get on separate pods because we have a different origin or a different destination. So that would be very different. Think of highways and how that you have the off ramps and the on ramps, and you have your main tube that that would be the the, the main right of way uh, for the faster speeds. So this is the. the Tia mentioned that there's a test track in Nevada. So there was a, there's a few companies out there in the world right now that are exploring Hyperloop technology. Uh, we did do our due diligence. We wanted to really look into this company and understand where it fell relative to the rest of the companies in the world. And Virgin Hyperloop One is the one that is the most uh, advanced at this time in this particular technology. It is the only company that has a test track. It is uh, half a kilometer long. Uh, and they have been able to reach 250 miles an hour, Thea, 240, 250. Uh, and imagine that's half a kilometer, and you're accelerating and decelerating to 240 all within half a kilometer. And they've done that, so they've, they've cleared uh, all of their milestones in terms of the technology development. And that next phase for them now is, so we've shown that we can do it on this half kilometer test track. The next step is a certification track that is a bit larger five to 10 miles, uh, in which they would you know, refine not just the right-of-way construction needs, but also the technology itself. And like Thea mentioned before, there's been several trips out there by now of Central Ohio and uh, Indiana, well, Ohio in general, and Indiana partners and Pennsylvania partners to go look at the technology and get a better understanding of the project. So one of the things that both projects did, both the, the environmental study for passenger rail and the Hyperloop uh, feasibility study, is that we looked at screening criteria uh, for uh, the routes. So this is a list here on the screen of the different things that were considered. So imagine a <coughs> matrix table and you are giving a value and you're basically seeing everything you know, on the table to see which 
which alternatives work best according to all of these different variables. And the engineering complexity is at the top for us on the Hyperloop project. We want to make sure that we um, are using or, or, or uh, proposing the more economically feasible uh, alternatives. So, for instance, you know, there, this technology, it's, whether it's going to be underground in a tunnel, whether it's going to be above grade or elevated or at ground at grade, you know, that all depends on the, on, the, on the topography and on the terrain needs, right? The last thing Virgin Hyperloop 1 or any of us would want is to go tunneling because that'll be the most expensive. So we looked at those routes and those route alternatives relative to that. How can we limit the tunneling? How can we limit the elevated components? We also looked at station criteria. So again, this is a list of the different things that we looked at in the station criteria, just to get a, a better like a sense of where would be the, the best location for these stations. And uh, on the right side of the screen there, you see a rendering of a Hyperloop station. And that was done by AECOM for Virgin Hyperloop 1 a, a, about a year ago uh, to, give them a better, to give us a better visual of what a, t a station could look like. So now it's for the fun part, the key findings of uh, these two studies. So one of the things we needed to find out is, is there a market? Is there a ridership market for the passenger component? Because as I mentioned, there are two things here for Hyperloop. There's ridership and there's uh, freight. So we wanted to look at future ridership. We wanted to look at cargo and see how much cargo would be moved through this mode. So here are the populations of the major cities along the way that, that would have a station, uh, a passenger rail and a Hyperloop. That's, that was the 2015 population. This is 2040 population. And this next slide shows you the increase in population. So as you can see, Central Ohio has over 24% of a population increase by the year 2040. So the finding was that, yes, indeed, we do have a market for this technology. We also looked at employment because a lot of the travel between Chicago and Columbus is business travel. So we wanted to understand what kind of population increases could be expected along the corridor. This is 2015 population, uh, sorry, employment, and this is 2040 employment. And if you can see the increase there, sorry, it... <laughs> There we go. Uh, the increase in population and in, in employment is also significant. Uh, every city has an increase in, in, in employment uh, by the year 2040. So yes, there is enough jobs to sustain this particular corridor. So I'm not, sorry, I'm trying to, there we go. So uh, for passenger rail findings, uh, this is again the study, uh, the environmental study component. Again, this is a photo of the route. Uh, you can see that the line between Chicago and Lima is a different type, is a darker purple. That is because that study was completed by uh, the uh, Northeast Indiana Passenger Rail Association. They hired another consultant uh, back in 2017, and they did the first bit of environmental work for the passenger rail project. So our task was to take what they had already done and do, it, and, and do our part from Lima out to Pittsburgh, and then sew both pieces together and get a better sense and, and basically have one deliverable. So this is what you see here in this particular uh, map. Uh, we also looked at those potential uh, stations and we looked at the city of Dublin and we met with city staff to uh, go over two potential locations and this was the one that made the more sense. Another one was further to the south, closer to Hilliard. So as you can see, that this is off of 161 uh, and, this is the, 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 and this is by the train tracks as well, on the train tracks. So these stations are envisioned to be uh, you know, combined. If we were to, to, to be able to do both modes, which would be the ideal thing, uh, you know, we would want to have uh, the same stations for both things. And the reason for that is simple, is that we want to be able to have them be able to move from mode, people to be able to move from mode to mode. Uh, you know, we, force, we envision Hyperloop as being in, like big movements across big cities, uh, across cities that are far apart, with, uh, you know, perhaps passenger rail or smaller Hyperloop routes in between for uh, more commuter type of uh, trips. So for the Hyperloop findings, what we did find is that we, ha we were able to um, create or we were able to find a feasible route 
that was able to maintain an average of 500 miles an hour optimal speed across the corridor. And that right there was a win because uh, there are certain parts in the country where that would not be necessary, that, that would not be possible without some significant tunneling. Uh, we also found that, like I mentioned before, uh, we were trying to see if we could do this all with an existing rail or road right-of-way. We're not going to be able to. So uh, we did find that some, right, some new right-of-way will be needed, some tunneling will be needed, and a bit of elevated here and there, but we try to keep that at a minimum. Um, we did a very preliminary cost-benefit uh, type of uh, analysis, and we found that $300 billion in overall economic benefits could be achieved, and this is a combination of different things from new industries to uh, one of the things that we found, for instance, in our freight uh, analysis was to understand what kind of goods we're going to be seeing more coming out of Central Ohio or across Central Ohio. Pharmaceuticals was one of them and high-end medical goods across this corridor. So when you start looking at things like that, those are high-value manufacturing goods that are coming out of our region, so out of like this entire corridor. So that's, that, that, that all got factored in as we were looking at economic benefits. Uh, 19 billion of those uh, economic benefits are direct transportation benefits over 30 years, and here are some highlights of what those um, involve. Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry, no, it's, um, here we go. Uh, so one of the first things was the tra travel time savings. You know, that, that was something that we really needed to get a, an understanding. So as you look at, this, at these lines, uh, we've shown different modes and how long it takes to travel across the three cities. So for auto and truck, as you can see from Columbus to Chicago, you're looking at about five hours, five to five and a half hours. Uh, and then for air, you're looking at about roughly around th three hours. Uh, for Hyperloop, it would take about 38 minutes, like under 40 minutes to be able to get from Chicago to Columbus. We also looked at fares. What would be some of those key findings and some of those, uh, like what would that look like? Like if, if Hyperloop were, was to be in place today, what would be the fare cost in order to, to travel on Hyperloop? Uh, these fares were calculated based on 20 cent per mile and uh, also adding some different uh, elements such as um, the Department of Transportation's value of time formulas and different things that help people uh, estimate fares and transportation projects. So I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, at this time, if, it, if we had a Hyperloop now, a trip from Chicago to Columbus uh, would be roughly $60. One of the things we looked at was environmental sustainability. Uh, one of the things that we did was to try to assess the emission savings that we would have. Now, the Department of Transportation has formulas that help you quantify in dollars what emission savings could, could mean. It's, it tells you a little bit more than giving you CO2 uh, you know, quantities and ratings. So these are very conservative. Uh, and the reason they're conservative is because we simply, all we did was calculate a mode shift. So we didn't. We didn't anticipate induced growth from the mode. Uh, what we did was just basically, if we eliminate cars that go into Hyperloop, you know, what would those be emission savings be? And it's roughly $127 million over 30 years in emission savings alone. So for the route alternatives, uh, like I mentioned um, here, we have, uh, this, this gives you a little bit more idea of what the entire corridor would look like. So in the orange, you have that grade. So that's closer if you look at Columbus. Uh, on the west, uh, sorry, east side of Columbus, you see a little bit more at grade corridors. Um, you have elevated for a majority of it. And by elevated, I don't mean like 30 feet in the air. It, 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 would, it could be, you know, it would vary depending on the topography, but it would not be able to be on the ground or at grade the whole way. Uh, the green lines represent a combination of bridging and tunneling. And if you notice, that happens going outwards towards Pittsburgh because of the topography and the mountain area, in the mountainous areas. Uh, and on the red dots, you see high bridges that are necessary because of the topography. The yellow dashed line represents tunnel. So again, this is the same station for the Dublin uh, potential station. And this is a rendering of, uh, that was created by uh, DP World, which is one of the partners for Virgin Hyperloop One. It's the Dubai ports of the world, one of the largest uh, logistics 
uh, companies in the world. They are a partner uh, for Virgin Hyperloop One. Uh, this is some of the renderings that they created. We have a, a whole bunch of others that we're happy to share should you ever uh, just shoot me an email and I can send them to you. Uh, we just chose the one that really gave a better idea of how the operations would, would, would occur uh, on, a, on a cargo portal. So for the next steps on this project, uh, we will, after the public, uh, uh, public officials debriefs, uh, once we collect your, co your, your comments and your questions and finalize the documents, we will be having public meetings in the new year. Uh, we are uh, going to be uh, uh, applying for a VHO certification segment project that Thea talked about, the International Hyperloop Certification Corridor Opportunity. Uh, this is a research and development opportunity that, that, that presents quite a lot of potential to our, to our region. Uh, we also found as we got into this that we did not develop a discipline in transportation planning for highways or for trucks or for air overnight. This is a project that you know, we built, Rome wasn't built in a day, so we, uh, we did recognize as we went through this that we're going to have to get some, some, some more collaborations happening. And one of those is with academic institutions, other federal and state agencies like the DOTs, uh, to look at things like travel demand modeling and a little bit to understand the, the mode better. And also on the technology side, you know, tapping into the, to, to all those resources that Central Ohio has in the, in the research and development industry. So we are going to be assisting in collaborating and putting those together uh, with Virgin Hyperloop One and other stakeholders in the region and across the corridor. We also, uh, as you can imagine, there is no regulatory framework for this. So if we wanted to construct something tomorrow, we would have a little bit of a roadblock with the federal agencies. So we have been working with ODOT, uh, with FHWA, and we are keeping uh, monitoring developments at the, at, at, in Washington to look for opportunities to, to work on that uh, regulatory framework along with other partners. Uh, at the federal agencies. Uh, and like I mentioned before, we just uh, look forward to continuing collaboration and facilitating this project and possibility for Central Ohio. Do you have any questions? For me? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm curious. Um, you know, I can't see us ever getting rid of rail. And I, I guess I don't know the dimensions of the uh, railroad right of ways that would allow Hyperloop to be next to rail. Do you know how much right of way a rail line has acquired? Yes. That would allow so, you to build a hyperloop next to it. So those are those are the types of discussions that we are um, engaged in. You know, as as we speak. You know, we we are we've been meeting with the Ohio Railroad Development Commission. Uh, we also, part of the uh, environmental study included uh, looking at that entire <laughs> rail right of way and and getting the dimensions of it. So we know the width for the whole thing. We also know what the right of way needs are for, 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 for Hyperloop and for rail. Now, the part where it gets really interesting is when you start seeing opportunities to use the infrastructure for Hyperloop to do things like, like, like um, uh, protection walls. Like if you're gonna build anything next to a rail, you have to have certain pillars, certain things. So we're looking at all of those. Those are more detailed design components, but we have done that first cut, which is to look at the right of way and identify there will be needs to acquire a little bit next to the rail right away in some spots at the most likelihood, yes. Yeah, that's what I was curious about. Thank mm -hmm. you. Any so, questions from council? Christine. Yeah, please. Um, in, in your calculations, um, do those estimates include, in terms of the fair rate that you might charge and all those things, would those include the maintenance costs? And what are the maintenance costs projected to be compared to rail and roadway maintenance? So. I alluded before, this is, uh, you know, the, the kind of, that type of information at this point, we are still... Still working on it? Yeah, like the, the technology is still being developed, right? So what kind of operating costs it would entail, I mean, those all depend on a lot of things that we're still at this time exploring. Gotcha. So what, I mean, what do you think, if in a perfect world, if everything went really well as you planned it to go, what, what do you think your timeline would be if if I had to really push you, um, in terms of being able to actually have something completed. You want me to handle that one? All right. Okay. So um, in, in talking to Virgin Hyperloop One about the possibilities of working with them and should all the funding fall into place, you can see the starts of a project like this in the 2020s. Um, to build out to Chicago or Pittsburgh, you're looking more 2040s, 2050s, but certainly you would have to make some sort of regional connections in order to be able to make show the benefit of this long term. So we would see connections within the region, you know, 
And Faye, you want to talk a little bit about what they're doing overseas and the construction that's currently underway? Yeah, they're working in India from Pune to Mumbai. It's 100 miles um, there, and uh, they've already started construction on that. Uh, they anticipate to uh, be fully constructed, I believe, by 2022 um, on that project. Uh, they would like to break ground on their um, uh, international test facility in the United States certification, sorry, certification facility, which is different than out in the desert, in 2023, 2024 which is what would be kind of the, our first toe in the water on this if should we win that opportunity. So with these employees who would work on this, would they be like a rail employee so they belong to the company or um, who, who's operating the thing? So, Councilwoman, thank you for that question. I feel like that it would be very, like any other traditional project, um, that these would be bidded projects that would, you know, seek the labor forces that are right here in our region. Um, uh, people who do pipe work um, or other types of construction on highways or rail could be utilized for this same skill set. And, and who would they work for? Who, who's their boss? Um, the winning contractor. So the contractor. So, yeah, gotcha. yeah, we would need skilled labor to, to build this. So there has got to be a ton of jobs associated with building this thing. Yes. So do you have projections on what that, I mean, because this is not just a 10-year project. This is a big, long project. Yeah. So it's not well, just. It's not only just one project, but to think about the fact that it would have to be a system. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Just like the highway system. I mean, so, in order to be effective, otherwise you're just a monorail. Right. <laughs> There's right. so many things that they'll learn from the construction the that they're doing now yeah. um, that will tell about maintenance and all of those kinds of things. But more importantly, I think... There's a lot of different materials to be looked at that could be utilized to construct the tube and how those might go together, um, the prefabrication of those, you know, where they would be fabricated um, for speed of construction. And uh, so I, I really appreciate the work that you guys have done. I realize there's a lot more questions that aren't answered than are. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, much like our interstate highway system, right, there was um, a lot of work that had to go into that, and there was, um, it was over a very long period of time. So I really appreciate the hard look into it and uh, certainly don't want to press you for answers that, that we uh, don't really have access to at this point. But I think can, the work that you're doing to continue to pursue the opportunity um, is really really fantastic work and, and because we don't have the all the answers doesn't mean we shouldn't proceed with seeking uh, the ability to add you know this country in more than a hundred years hasn't seen any new form of transportation right we've seen improvements in existing forms of transportation but in terms of uh, new transportation we really have not progressed much and, and this is real this is I think the first real opportunity to progress in that space and Morpsey is doing a fantastic job I met with the um, our director of the NTSB out at uh, TRC last week, and they are working diligently on um, trying to become the proving grounds, the testing grounds, the um, grounds that would uh, give the safety certifications for this kind of transportation. And uh, it's really exciting, and thanks for working in that space. Yeah, I agree. I think it's amazing, and I, I don't want you to take my questions as being pressuring. That's not it. I'm actually really excited. Yeah, I was and just going to comment. Um, you know, a lot of the questions that you had about operation uh, and maintenance and all of that, those are the kind of questions that will be informed once you actually get that certification track going. Right. You know, you get to see how the system f like works, how it works within a 10-mile, you know, segment or 5-mile segment. So that's why it's so uh, important uh, to see this as for what it is, which is a research and development uh, for a mode that, you know, for everything that we see, it's coming. It's yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's my anticipation more than anything is what those amazing, I mean, you know, there are environmental impacts, there are, uh, you know, as you said, cargo impacts, people impacts, it's just a lot of impacts. And so it's more sort of my curiosity and, and my excitement to see what's coming. Mm -hmm. um, but really appreciate you coming and, and sharing this with us. It's really, it is, it's important work. And Chris's point is well taken about uh, transportation modes and, and that, you know, we haven't seen new ones in quite some time. So anyway, so thank you. So don't take my questions as pressuring. They're really about more about excitement. 
No, and one last point is this is not meant to be a replacement mode. A lot of people think that because we're looking at Hyperloop, we're, we're trying to get take away their car or take away their plane. No, this is something that is going to supplement a system that is already maxing out with e-commerce and with increases in population. This is our, 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 our human nature coming to play and, and evolving to find better ways to move in mass quantities. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Jane? Just a couple of. If in, in the ideal world, would you want to have rail and Hyperloop together? Would that be a preference, or do you prefer Hyperloop alone? Are you asking me personally? Honestly, this is why the, the, the RSTI's focus is, is, is better connections. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of advocacy people there that are out there for both modes. They're very Hyperloop centric and very passenger centric. And for us, it's more like what makes sense economically and for our regions and for the populations that we're moving. So that's what we're looking at. And, and these studies, you know, there's several of them. It's not just the one shot. So we've completed that first phase, and that is a big win. We're, we're, we're moving down that road. Um, ideally, I'm a choices girl. I would love to walk out the door and decide whether I want to fly, run, walk, swim, you know, right. to wherever I'm going. Right. And economic prosperity comes in the forms of transportation modes to regions. So. Right. And my, my last question would be, uh, well, I have a million, but I'm only going to use one more. Um, if in the best case scenario, the federal government looks at this or the, the uh, prototype in India is so successful and we get the certification to move on. In the best case scenario, if funds were available sooner than later, would this come to fruition sooner than later? If all the, all the ducks were aligned in the right form, in the right way, it would come sooner than later. Okay. Uh, we've all seen what happens when every level of government decides they want something. And okay. so this is the perfect example. Okay. So. And Jane, to your point about the rail, you know, there are other, so we are in competition, as Thea said, with, you know, 10 other potential routes. I think there were five represented at Hyperloop on the Hill when we were in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. One of them was uh, St. Louis to Kansas City, and they were utilizing uh, the I-70 corridor. So not all of them are looking at utilizing railway corridors. Mm -hmm. Some markets are looking at utilizing other kinds of corridors, but as you can imagine, if you had to do easement acquisition from scratch, you probably would just stop. Um, so, right. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there, there, it's just not going to be next to rail. I think it'll be a combination of a whole lot of different things. Okay. Thank you very much for coming in. Greatly appreciate your time. Thank you. And if you need additional information from us, feel free to reach out to us. We'll reach out. Thank you Thanks very you. much. Appreciate Have a great it. Evening. You too. Uh, review of the city's general fund balance policy. Matt. Good evening, Council. As you, as you are aware, uh, the general fund balance policy requiring a balance of no less than 50% of the general fund expenditures was adopted in September of 2016. This codified the city's long-standing practice of following such a policy. As part of that policy, it indicated that it would be reviewed and reaffirmed every three years. So tonight's staff is uh, requesting that you take one of the following actions. Uh, the first one would be to accept a motion reaffirming the current general fund policy. Your second option is to refer the policy to the Finance Committee for additional review. And your third option would be to direct staff to add this policy to the agenda for the upcoming operating budget workshop. Um, if you could please. Yeah, does anybody have a strong, pro it seems as though the first one is the most streamlined to get us from here to there. So I guess I would propose, can we live with the first option? Affirming the current general fund balance policy. I had a question. Okay, go. Um, I, I I think it's well written policy. My my question was about the excess funds, and that's I guess uh, section seven um, that talks about at the end of the year if the general fund balance were to exceed seventy five percent of actuals, the balance then moves to the CIP. Do we? Do we do that? Because our fund balance at some times were greater than that. Um, it was. I think it's happened a couple times, and we did yeah. make that transfer on at least two occasions that I recall seeing. But I recall that we haven't always, when we knew we were going to make a planned expenditure that was going to bring it down, um, I believe we, we waived that because we knew we were going to spend that money on some capital assets. Um, so that is an option. 
and we have exercised and waived that option depending upon uh, the activities that are planned in the CIP. And the, the, the point of that particular um, facet of this, I'm, I'm asking a question, is to put the money to work so that the, the balance of that fund wouldn't just continue to grow over time. Is that, is that the essence of that or? It is, and the, the only other thing I would, I would say, it is, is the, is the answer. The other thing I would, I would say too is this policy's only been in effect for a short time and, and a couple of years, right? So, so there hasn't been a lot of experience with that part of the policy and that, that was, well, it's always been a standing policy of council on the reserves. The formalized policy has only been in place for a couple of years, and then this was a nuance that was added into that. So it hasn't been in play all that long. You could change the uh, director of finance will transfer 25 to may transfer, and then that would give the council the flexibility to decide whether. They yeah, want to I, do it I or not. think. Yeah, I just wanted to get some yeah. background on it. I, I think what it does do is if. If there's money and we, we should put the money to work right for the for the city I get that but I I like the May word thank you Mike on that because I think there may be I wouldn't want to require that necessarily if we had some things there was just some clarification on the intent of that I'm, that policy well, can you tell me again what section you were in seven seven okay because it does say council may elect to transfer an amount in excess of 20 in excess it but be. it says the first one it will transfer that oh got it okay. it will yeah. yeah make it consistent oh i see yep got it okay yeah she want both those to be may yeah i just think it gives some flexibility but yep. it still it still sets the policy which is put the money to work so that was my only so do we need to make a motion to amend that language or can you just reconcile it you can uh just refer to the amendment when you approve the so i do I remember this conversation before it may not be in right but I, I remember it was very intentional that will was in there um, now that I think about it I, I remember Angel was pretty adamant about that as finance director to do that that way now but council has the prerogative to change it in any event you can change it any time whenever but, you want but, so but the idea was was very intentional about transferring that 25 percent in excess of the 75 percent to the seat to the capital I, you know, at my point of view, I think it's always better to have a policy that um, gives us some flexibility there. So we're not amending the policy at the same time we're we're making it the, the a needed change. Does that? I don't know if I'm articulating yeah, that I, very I, well. I think, in my memory's coming back, which can be dangerous, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that what we were looking at, at least at our level, was the exception. That, that decisions would be made by exception. So, well, how does the upon the recommendation by the city manager play into this? Then, is it, is it, it will transfer, and then does it come back to you? As well, city I think what this is saying is, is we will transfer it, but then upon the recommendation by the city manager, city council may elect to transfer an amount. So I think you, you have that option no matter what. But the but the act that that our our level is to to ensure its transfer, but then you may elect to otherwise well if you've already transferred it now you're telling us we may elect to transfer I mean I don't think the words make any sense to me but it seems like they're see what I'm saying it's not consistent did a lawyer do this <laughs> of course not of course not no our, our I just remember our former finance director beat me about the head and shoulders over this because well <laughs> I would have, she, she's not so a that's why yeah I know so why don't we have but, why don't we have legal look at it and give us uh, give us their opinion but I don't think it reads like anything I'm used to seeing I guess I'd like to go back and 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 just clarify the record on the intent of that and, and research that particular I, point I'm not opposed to it at all I just want to go back Mike, the key intent was was it not to make sure that we put the money to work is that was that the intent of that okay so I think we need some language to in yeah I think the language can be read that makes sense I mean it says that the finance director will transfer it which is the rule if City Council they may step in and suspend that rule. That, and that's how read I read it I think that was the act, intent but but if it needs to be clarified we can clarify it. so if we clarify it that do you guys want to reaffirm the policy yes because yes, yes. Because remember, we when we yeah. set we set policy to set clear direction on. Remember, we're trying so to, to be clear. This policy is also in response to feedback we were getting it's from, a work the, in progress. from the bond date. Well, <laughs> well, I, I would go as far as to say this was in response to some input from the bond rating agencies about setting, you know, 
things more specifically and then making decisions by exception. And I really think that's, that's why this language is the way it is. Because I just remember we really work this hard, but that doesn't mean it's right, but that doesn't mean that's what you want to do going forward. But I think this I, is I'd just like to retreat and think about that. On it, but it might be get some clarity around it, so that would be. So could we pass it tonight and you clarify what the language means? I just prefer you wait, maybe wait. What you do it. Right. Oh, so we'll just put this whole thing on. Just table it and, and let's come back on that. Yeah, I'll, move, I'm, I'll move we table. Second. I'll second. Oh, God. Anne. Uh, Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. Vice Mayor Ambrose Grooms? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Ludo? Yes. Okay. Uh, historic Dublin Visioning Strategy. Okay. Good evening, members of council. So in your previous council packet, and this one is information regarding staff's recommend, recommended approach to council's goal, which was to establish a vision for historic Dublin. And this goal also mentioned the possibility of a task force. Staff recommends council appoint a task force of key stakeholders to assist with this visioning process and that the task force use Heritage Ohio's downtown assessment resource team visit or DART visit to provide an initial facilitated visioning process. The cost of the DART visit is $5,000, which includes two community visits, an organizational plan, community visioning exercise, stakeholder, or in, in our case would be a task force, a visioning exercise, strategic recommendation and includes a one-year affiliated level membership with the Main Street program. Staff has provided more detailed information in your packets along with the memo more specifically about the DART process. Should you agree with this recommendation, uh, we would be seeking some direction regarding the auth authorization to engage Heritage Ohio for $5,000 for the DART visit, direction to bring back a resolution at your next meeting to establish the task force with names, the composition of the task force, it was suggested in the memo unless you, unless you prefer some other configuration. Um, this would also include a recommended chair and vice chair and direction and deadlines for the task force. Uh, we recommend the appointment of a task force for one year. That's pretty consistent with task forces in the past, though there may be intermittent recommendations too and decisions by council along the way. Of course, I'm a believer that work expands the time to fill the allot work expands to fill the time allotted for it. So. If you wanted a shorter time frame, that'd be something that, that you can certainly determine on your um, if you'd like it to be a shorter time frame. And then uh, staff um, will try to answer any questions you have at this time. So if maybe we break these down and take them in smaller bites. First, the idea of engaging Heritage Ohio. It costs us $5,000. They come in and they do a DART visit. Um, focusing on that idea, does anybody have comment on that? I have a couple of comments. I don't disagree with utilizing a Heritage Ohio or or down or a Main Street. I, I think it has great potential, especially when it comes to building um, the uh, economic development and the business aspect of the downtown. My concern is maybe a little more holistic. And um, when you think about envisioning what Bridge Street looks like and what the historic district looks like, I think it requires maybe first a uh, community conversation because I think there are a lot of opinions out here. The stakeholder group that we have here is mainly those who um, are located within the historic district. That's great if you're looking for economic development and that sort of thing, but I think that the heart of, this, of the city is um, a sensitive conversation to the community at whole. I think if we had the opportunity to even have a town hall meeting or, or bring in someone like um, that, that stimulates conversations, there's a group, there's a, it's called Strong Towns, uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Charles Marone, um, comes to communities to just discuss what it is you want the heart of your, your, your town to be like. Not about just economic development, but, but also to have a conversation of what that character, what that life is like in the area. And, and we know that there has been many changes downtown um, for the good, but also it changes, in, in many ways, it can change the character of the way a place lives. Um, Heritage Ohio is preservation. Main Street uh, USA is more about economic development. I think if we have a conversation first to kind of gauge the community interest, and then focus down to the economic development piece with the Main Street or Heritage Ohio, 
we'll have a better guidance for them to help them understand what the community is envisioning for their for their center. I think the timing uh, may need to come after a, a holistic conversation. Yeah, I, I'd just like to clarify that, that <clears throat> we're really just looking for a third party facilitator, which is why we focused in on the experience of these folks. It's really not just about economic development. It would be that broader visioning. Mm -hmm. Part of the DART process is that broader community conversation. The task force is just, your, you know, your, the people carrying the water on trying to keep the movement going and creating action plans and massaging that. The DART was intended to be that very thing you're talking about. There would be the, the stakeholder um, a group exercise that it talks about, but they're very much a part of this is the greater community conversation and a focus on the greater community input. So I, I just don't want it to be lost that that was our intent too. No. Uh, it's just how you do it and who does it. I mean, it really doesn't right. matter to us who does it. Right. This is the group that we found that, that we thought had probably the best experience. And, and again, the focus being a third party that is not the city. It's not folks, you know, that are there. It's just yeah. having somebody else come in with a different set of eyes and, and those kind of skill sets. So. And, I, and I totally agree with the benefit of that. As I looked down and looked at their schedule, the broader community conversation happened at the end of this schedule than at the beginning. And I think that's my, my thought, is that um, I'm, I don't have a problem with bringing in a third party. I just would like to see the larger whole community conversation first, almost as if addressing the community plan prior to bringing in the Main Street program. And I think that would give us a better buy-in by the community as we as we funnel down into looking at it more focused with the Main Street project. That's what, I, I, I totally I'm get that from. and I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the, the thing that probably is not very clear in this is the perspective of time and timeline. Those things happen within 24 hours of each other in a DART visit. So you, you so they're happening almost simultaneously. The, the initial exercise is just sitting with the stakeholders and getting a, a sense of feel and everything and then it's then it's about the community input you can flip that whatever but those are happening within a matter of hours of each other just to understand how that works so but again however you all want to go forward with this is and maybe related to that then if you look at the makeup of the group there's two residents if you will in that whole group yeah, and there might be a need to I was looking at number C or item C about who their couple residents and I think Jane's point and, and one that I observed is residents also from outside the historic district to be as well so maybe maybe also ramping up the the numbers of or the composition of that group and maybe mm -hmm. I, uh, Greg I'm going to point number two here on no, this that's list okay. but um, you know just to make sure it, it is a treasure for the the whole community and make sure we get enough of the right. resonant voices in here. That was the observation when Particularly I... Particularly adjacent ones, I, I would think, yeah. like Waterford, uh, maybe Llewellyn Farms, maybe um, Indian Run, you know, uh, some, uh, so just a representative from... There are, uh, they, they do recommend about 18 folks, so it's really trying to, and, and thank you for whatever yeah. direction you want, we'll make that happen. The, the, um, they were focused on about 18, so we're trying to cover down on all the different interest groups, but, but also just want to point out two HOA reps from other than the historic district. If you want to ramp that piece up, could ramp that up yeah. some more. And I guess I think this is sort of an opportunity. I would assume the ARB and, and the DCBB, all of those, would, would have some, some input in this. I don't want to say um, distinct and apart from this, but I will say distinct and apart from this working group. I think it's really important to get more representation of the community and then maybe have presentations and discussions because I think um, there has been so much happening here to, to, to really get some new voices in, in, in here I think would be, would be incredibly valuable and I think appreciated by the community. But overall, I think it's a, it's a very good plan. It's more a, a composition question on my end. And, and the timing, I think your point is right. very, really important. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more about the additional representation. I, I do think it's important. I, I mean, your point's taken. There's HOA reps on here, but um, it would be nice to hear some voices that, that aren't necessarily the heads of the HOAs because they're typically the ones we're regularly engaging. Um, and so it'd be nice to have some voices that we're not always hearing all the time. Um, I think they're great. It's awesome to have that 
that support and that conversation with our HOAs. They're a critical part of how we do things. Um, but there's a lot of other voices out there that I think could play a really, really critical role in this. So I, I would head nod to that as well. Well, what we can do in response to that, <clears throat> if, if, the, if, this is, if this is, if you want to do the task force, is we can, when we come back with a, like an appointing resolution, we could add more HOAs in there, and then you, or not HOA, but representation from, from more residents, and then you can kind of pick and choose from that if you want more. If it's, we'll add a lot more, and then you can, you can determine if you want less or that same or whatever. Let me ask a question real quick, because I don't know whether we're talking about different issues or not. If you look at the, the, the schedule, right, so it seems as though whoever it is, we think a person coming in and helping facilitate this conversation is a good thing whether it's DART or strong towns or whatever, whoever it is. So the DART visit, though, at the end of the first day, there's a community visioning session. Is that open to the public where everybody will be able to come in and everybody will be advertised? Because I know when we've had, like, the <coughs> bike task force and all the different task force, they always have an opportunity for public comment and people to come in and participate, which I think is different. I mean, if we had 500 people show up, we put 500 people on this committee, it's going to just implode and we're not going to make any progress so right is that a opportunity for people anybody that wants to attend to attend when it says community so the community visioning is 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 that singular session in an evening to to bring the greater community in and the thing i want to remind you of is or the intent here is not to be the end all be all of this process your task force really is this is to get them out of the gates this is to get one you know, get a, an initial uh, visioning process going that starts to generate ideas and, and cr start to create some vision. But I would think, like we have with many other task forces in the past or committees, you want them to continue to formulate that, which I think would invite and should invite more input from the public, and there could be more sessions. You could, you could choose to bring another speaker in or someone, like you mentioned, Council Member Fox, or others along that path. This is just to try to get get the task force up, get it running, get an initial shot at some visioning and input, and then go and then go from there. And, and I think the other value that this provides is it brings in some outside folks that have run, not that we want to be a Main Street program, I want to be real clear about that, that is not our recommendation, but you have people who have sort of lived this, done this, and, and can share their experience um, in their own communities as well, and give you that assessment and perspective to add to the flavor of, of the outcome of this initial process. So, again, you know, we've had a lot of success with these kind of citizen-run committees and task forces, and I think as long as you're clear in your direction, you have them report back to you, you can, you can drive how much public input and how often and as that, as that unfolds. Does that make sense? It does, but I, but I, and I, and I agree that I, I think to have the conversation started by a third party is, is great. Um, it's really important, though, I think, for the community to understand why we bring them in and what their objectives are. Because if they think it's just for economic development, but the conversation doesn't include the preservation, the, the visioning of the character of what the entire area looks like, those are the questions that the public keeps bringing to the surface. They understand economic development and in many ways are, are frightened by what it will do to their community as a whole. Um, there is the economic development side of planning an area, and then there's the people side of planning an area. What does it do to your neighborhood? How does it change the scope of it? What does it do to the character? How does it change the traffic? Those are the things that they, much, much of the public cares about. So when we do this, I think it's important that we understand what the visioning process is trying to achieve. Uh, not just how much money will it bring downtown, or how many buildings and what kind of buildings, but what is the vision that we're looking for? And that's what I, what I guess I, I wanted to be sure that, that Heritage Ohio and Main Street program, those are the questions that they'll ask of the stakeholders and that the community has the opportunity to respond to. Well, and once I, I hear you, yeah, I hear you loud and clear on that. I couldn't agree more. I, I think the thing that we want to make sure we're doing is in the, when we set up, and this has been sort of this, a standing policy of council, when we set up task forces, task forces are meant to be short-term, spe spe specific mission, specific direction, which then these things can be, you know, embedded in your direction. And then um, you're not, obviously you don't want to dictate outcome, but you want to influence, if you will, or drive the direction so that the outcomes that 
you know, they could address the full range of issues and concerns you have. So given what you've said tonight or if there are other comments, you know, yet tonight or email me some ideas, we will try to incorporate that in the resolution to give, give the task force its guidance that it needs, if, if you want to go that way. So we could do the DART evaluation process, get this steering committee put in place, have a community vision session like you have here, but we could add additional community input sessions like Jane is concerned about. Oh, I think you'd want to, yeah. And, I and think continue would. that ball rolling. So the idea of DART is to get someone who's experienced about historical preservation and all those issues to get this off the ground and then go through this schedule. We can always change the schedule and add meetings if we want to. Mm -hmm. Does that address your concerns? Right, it does. And I, and I think it's very important that we, we let the community know that this is just the beginning out the gate. This is an opportunity and that what, what we were planning to do is to have community conversations with maybe various speakers to just get the, get the town hall conversations going, the roundtable conversations going, which gives us direction on what the mood is. What the, it's not only just about the downtown, but it's also about as we're looking at community the community plan and re-looking at that, it will bring forward a lot of thought by the public on how fast are we growing? What do they want us to look like in 20 years? There's all kinds of conversations that can be spurred with the beginnings of this, with community conversations along with it, I think. So yes, I think Kathy, we do that. what do you think? Yeah. The only thing I'm, I, I again go back to, I, the composition of the steering committee, I think we just, be, I think, everyone on this particular suggested theory committee has an important and a unique perspective. Let's just make sure we have enough re resident perspective in there. That's my point. I agree and with I that. And we also clear. have to, you, you have to open it up. If people want to come participate, they can. Right. Yeah. You know, I think being on the steering yeah. committee as opposed to being an attendee to the meeting might be two different things. Yeah. And, I'm, but, and I think they both have an important role. Thank you. And I think a lot of times, and, and this I think is something that happens with it, I mean this council in this city has been pretty supportive of the historic district and preservation and all that. There are a lot of really tricky issues with preservation that, and sometimes people are at cross purposes. You know, what this person wants and what this person wants isn't going to exist together at the same time. So you have to have that conversation to come up with a solution. So. Um, you know, you need to have balance, but you've got to be careful that you do not get too many people on these. I've served on some of these committees. Our Grounds of Remembrance had 30, 30 veterans, all with a different idea, ranging from World War II to the latest conflict. And, and it was very, very difficult. So get a good cross-section representative, but make sure you don't have too many. Numbers, numbers can be a killer for a steering committee. Totally agree. And, and, and I would just say I would err on the residents versus some of the others in, in the composition of this particular committee because others will have voices into this and they have strong voices. That's, I, I agree, Mike, I would just err on the residents. Well, and I think our advertising and communicating these meetings is extremely important and adding more of them if, if necessary is really important. So I'm gonna take a shot at this and I make a motion that we authorize staff to engage Heritage Ohio for $5,000 to conduct a DART visit. I'll second that. And? Ms. Aluto. Yes. Mr. Reiner. Yes. Vice Mayor Ambrose Grooms. Yes. Ms. Fox. Yes. Mayor Peterson. Yes. Mr. Keenan. Yes. Uh, Mr. Rosa. Yes. I also make a motion that we appoint a task force or steering committee uh, with representation as suggested on the memo. Are there specific additional groups you'd like to add now? Names being later. Specific individuals yet to be determined but any individual. I was looking for a little bit of a different composition, I guess is yeah. what I was saying, in, in deference to and in, in agreement with Mike's point about too many is too much, just adding a bunch more. Again, what, I, what I'm thinking here, Greg, is, is a lot of these folks will have voices and inputs in here. This is just a wonderful opportunity to get somewhere resident in it. So the composition I'm suggesting might need a little tweaking. So if, if the resolution is in agreement with it, with a somewhat, yes, we need a task force, and, but that is just my particular perspective. Well, I think Dana heard that discussion. You might be able to come up with that list, but it seems to me you don't need three people from Waterford Village, but you might need one, right. and you might need one from Indian Run. Right. Uh, and, and so that's the different perspective. Right. So, I'm saying that's the Right, thing. Yep. okay. Yep. So what if, what, what if I, in just trying to move this along, um, so HOA basically in my mind just means a resident, right? So it's a community representative from other than the historic district, what if we change that number two to the number five? 
the very last one, M, the letter M, as in Michael, under stakeholder. I, we're up to the steering committee. The, com, the structural composition of the steering committee, not the individuals. Well, I'm with Kathy. I think, I think as I look at this, like, like I'm not sure why the Dublin Public Library is, is a stakeholder or the Dublin Community Church is a stakeholder. I mean, they all have input. They can be, I can see the Historic Society, I can see the Chamber, because they're larger representations, but, but I think there, it's, it's heavy on a, a few with singular perspective than uh, a group that would have a larger uh, perspective voice. I think that's, I guess I would like time to make some recommendations. I don't know that I can do it on the fly, but well, that's, that's I, the only thing here. I, I, w I would recommend, I mean, this was a, this was a straw man, okay, <laughs> just trying to cover bases. So I would recommend you remove ARB. I mean, given this conversation, I would recommend you remove ARB, remove Dublin Chamber, remove the library, remove the community, remove the community church, remove the schools, because we can get their input, and we and they can we can keep them advised, and they can come to meetings and give input. That's not a requirement. Uh, I mean, it is a requirement that they give input, but to be on this task force, and then you replace those with residents. Yeah. What and, if instead of one, 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 and one, we just said like eight people, eight individuals to be determined at our. So about yeah, half of this becomes actually right. residents from outside. Residents, and then, and and, then we and have... two from inside, I'll call it South yes. High Street, Franklin Street. Right, so if we left A the way it is, historic business, yes. buildings, and landowners, there's three. Historic businesses, three. Historic residents, one of each of those two streets. And then, so A, B, and C would remain the same. That would leave one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven additional members to be determined later. I think that's great. Okay. So then those three, first three, have their clear designated representation. The balance of the members we would determine based on a list brought forth by staff. And, and we can call and make our suggestions and talk to people and everything else. Yes, A, B, and C would stay the way that it is. And then the balance, D through M, would just become a catch-all of 11 additional members to get us to 18 but we can decide those individuals later. Right, That's, that sounds much better. And then if we could better. also maybe add, just it. for to emphasize the importance, Dana, on the schedule, when we would advertise to the community and what we would do to advertise the community about the community visioning session. Yeah, we, we could come forward with like a, with a communications plan along with the resolution and, and at least to get this up and going and, and then let the, as we should, let the task force drive it uh, after that, given your direction and guidance that you give them, so does that address your concerns, John? It does. It does. Okay, so John, no, you're on. Right Christina, yep. Michael, Chris. So, just so I understand, so, you, so you're removing. So we just go A, B, C, mm -hmm. and then D would be eleven additional representatives okay. from the community. So does it matter if HDBA, DCVB? We could take CSAC off too. I, I think that would allow us to pick those people if we wanted to. Oh, so you're not, thinking those would be among the 11 potentially? Could be. Okay, so I need to come back with a resolution. So you're going to then what? Email me some ideas or? Well, our step three was that this, ta oh, we were going to create this task force for serve for one year from appointment. A resolution will be advertised and brought forward for council's action. Is that what, what would include the individual names? You probably have to name. Some of these people may have dual roles. You may have somebody uh, that's uh, on the chamber that also is a resident down there. I, I can think of several examples just right off the top of my head. That, that, those are but the kind you know, of things you need to look did at. We this for that historical, whatever we call that piece out front of the library, you know, signature transition piece. We did that, and it worked, and we came up with the name. So maybe if we just make sure we have those three represented, and then we can all call you guys and you can suggest some people, I guess. Okay. And give us a list of Could people. you just establish the task force with the various yes. components? Yes, so I make a motion then then a that we appoint a task force for expand. one year uh, with the representation as it's set forth, A, B, and C, and letter D be 11 additional members to be determined by council. And just to muddy the waters a little bit more while we're at it. <laughs> um, would you, would, the, would council be interested in establishing the, who the, chair and vice chair is or would you prefer they appoint that from within I, I think you need it you'll need a chair and vice chair it's usually 
how things roll. I, I think we'll need probably need to appoint a chair and a vice chair because I, I, I think structure is going to be important or it's going to go off the rails, someone that's particularly skilled. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I think councils so. over time have done it both ways. It, you know, depends. Plus, you want somebody that's willing to do the job. Right. So yep. maybe we can do that when we appoint them. Yep. And understand that's what, that job that's what I would yeah. recommend. That's what I would recommend as you, yeah. if you go that yep. route. Okay. So, did that so make you'll sense? send out a memo, and then we will all give, we will all provide you names back. What? Or an email or something, and we'll right. provide you suggestions. Mm -hmm. okay. And when, how, when do you think you'd bring that back, Dan? Two weeks? I'd like to, yes. Okay. So I, I already think we're behind schedule, but as long as we get this thing going, we're going. Okay. So now we need a second to that motion, right? Second. Did you get the motion, or do you want me to do it again? No, we have the motion. I'll you second. Move. John will second. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Ms. Saludo. Yes. Mr. Reiner. Yes. Vice Mayor Amaro Grooms. Yes. Ms. Fox. Yes. Mayor Peterson. Yes. Mr. Keenan. Yes. And Mr. Rosa. Yes. Okay. Are we still doing this art in public places thing, Dana? No. Uh, just under some, no. Uh, well, I, I, under staff comments, I was okay. going yep. to there. suggest something there. So, uh, if I can find my notes here. Okay, so um, uh, are you ready for that now? Yep, okay, sorry. Ahead. So as uh, council's aware, the city traditionally budgets $75,000 annually for art and public places projects, and this resides in the bed tax fund. For various reasons, this money has not been spent uh, or expended for four years, and there exists a balance of $300,000 uh, in that fund currently for this purpose. Uh, the clerk of council posted the art and public places selection policy to your board pack library. I don't know if you got a chance to look at that or not. The staff recommends council direct staff and council's liaison because that's what the policy calls for um, to go ahead and work with the Dublin Arts Council to start the process to identify potential art and public places sites as well as uh, two other things in the policy rec recommends I'm going to have the wrong words. Uh, types of uh, types or um, modes of, of uh, art that could be placed there for your consideration. It's a call for artists. Is that not, not I don't think you go or? for the call of artists quite yet. That comes back to council before you do that. Well, we've uh, never directed the projects. That was one no, of the reasons. We've never determined the artwork, but right. there are what's the words, Michelle? It's it's there's. Well, actually, the types of co council does a site selection, and Correct. then it is turned over to the Arts Council to go from there. To, to go from there with a, a call for artists. There's right. a committee form then that looks at those proposals when they come back actually, in. Actually, I've got it right in front of me. I found it. So, <laughs> so, um, I, so, staff, council liaison, and the Arts Council staff typically work together to review sites and propose potential sites to council. That also, and these are the words I was looking for, also uh, they can uh, propose possible themes and mediums, it's called, general types of artwork that could be placed in these areas. It's not the artwork. Once <coughs> council determines that, that it has a site or sites in this case, maybe, then, um, then you would direct uh, then you would go forward from there and do a call for artists and start the process of determining the artwork. And then that is that happens without council. That's, that's So there's a real opportunity with $300,000 in the bank to do a really, really nice project in, you know, what's been four years, correct? Or a couple really nice projects. Or even a couple, yeah, in indeed. City. So let's see what, let's see what happens. But thank you, Dana, for a good explanation of a very complex thing. It's taken years to work out in a million Well, hours. I, I want to give Michelle the credit for that. She yeah. has uh, worked this for many decades, I think. Well, early on, we got put in the role of having to decide what the art was. That, yeah. that, was, that was not good. <laughs> no. We did not want to be in the business of picking the art, most especially when some of the pieces that came forward became quite controversial. It, was, it wasn't us. It was the Arts Council that did that. So. Now, the, um, the uh, new uh, proposal for the group that uh, works at the Art Council or the volunteer group that was brought forward, that would be the group that would be deciding art. Is that in place? No, that's the other piece. So the um, Public Art Strategic Plan mm -hmm. needs to come back to the Public Services Committee of Council because that committee gave feedback on the structure of that Public Arts Commission. So we, we put that information together. We want to bring that back. And then that would come forward to council as a recommendation. So what we'd like to do is do that at the same simultaneous time. That, that probably won't go into effect until December or maybe early next year. 
and we can start this process under the current process that's in place and it, it would not involve that Public Arts Commission until not. next time. The benefit of that Public Arts Commission though that um, some of the benefit of that uh, would not would not be a disadvantage uh, not utilizing that for these projects. There's still a committee that selects the artists and that would be made up of um, a, a council rep um, and other residents as well. So the composition would be somewhat similar. Professional artists are part of that as well. So it's very similar okay. to the commission. Okay. Yes, I'd like to add that we had that um, the Laurel Poet, I think I said that correct, with the piece that was put together that was uh, we, we we was shared with us at the State of the City a few years ago. Somehow, some way, I I would really like to see that incorporated in, into one of these projects, uh, if there's several or, or what have you. That this would be an opportunity to really do that right, and we have ample opportunity in Riverside Park. Uh, you know some of the other things that are going on in and around town. So, so you need a motion for us to reinitiate the procedure that was in place before for site selection. Correct. I make that motion. I'll oh. second it. Um, sorry, Ms. Amor, Vice Mayor Amherst Grooms. Yes. Ms. Saludo. Yes. Mr. Keenan. Yes. Ms. Fox. Yes. Mr. Rosa. Yes. And Mayor Peterson. Yes. Okay. One, uh, two other items. On Saturday, October nineteenth, um, staff will host the opportunity for residents to um, come to the Brandon Pond. There's a memo in your packet about Brandon Pond and help with. Uh, um, helping to secure wildlife from the area, uh, catching along frogs, with the consultant catching frogs and right. things like that, um, on October 9th from nine to noon, and that will be at in the vicinity of Brandon Pond. Correct, Matt. So, uh, hope everyone come out for that. Last, I just want to congratulate um, Michelle on her selection as the new city manager for Hilliard, Ohio. Um, I, I can't begin to tell you how proud I am of Michelle for, for doing this. I think, as you know, Hilliard, Ohio is, is transitioning their form of government to council manager plan. She knows a little bit about that, <laughs> having worked in this environment for a while. I just think she's put together a really unique resume and just possesses the right skill sets to help that community through that process. And I just want to congratulate her. Too bad for us, lucky for them, but I'm glad she's going to be a neighbor and we'll continue to look forward to working with her in the future. So. Thank you. Dan. Oh, and we still have her till December her. 31st. We're going to put a bigger saddle on her here uh, between now and then. There you go. Yeah, something like that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, she hasn't run out sooner, right? But anyway, oh, that's all I have, Mary. Thank right? you, Dana. Uh, committee reports. P and Z, Jane. How about admin, Chris? Uh, we did have we did have some staff discussions today, and there was an admin committee meeting added to your calendar. So uh, hopefully you all saw that and have it noted. Thanks, Chris. Community development, John. Uh, we're going to have a meeting on Wednesday the ninth from five to seven. So I'll see you all there. Thanks, John. Finance, Mike. I have nothing. Public services, Christina. Uh, we have a meeting scheduled for Wednesday after. John's meeting. Wow. I know. That's Tell me about it. Night. Uh, Coda, Kathy. Uh, yes, thank you. Just one quick thing. I had the opportunity to join staff at the annual luncheon, Coda luncheon, um, last week. Um, and sort of the big reveal or announcement was Coda's uh, rolling out of an electronic payment. So you could now do bus fares either by a card, by cash, or now a new phone electronic payment. And um, a wonderful step forward there um, and as you know the group is continuing to work with smart um, Columbus to try to make that particular or a variation of that particular electronic payment be um, uh, ubiquitous across different types of transportation payment that's a little longer term plan but a, a very big step forward and um, I will keep you updated on how that goes so thank you thank you Kathy Dublin Friendship Association Christina nothing this time Morpsy Chris uh, we heard from them this evening, so um, fun stuff going on. LUC Regional Planning Commission, Kathy. Um, I just want to make a, a quick quote, n n not directly about that, but I had mentioned in the last meeting that um, I joined staff, uh, Megan was there and some other staff, about the um, uh, ODOT plans to build a vision for the 33 quarter, and the kickoff meeting for that was a couple, I can't keep my dates here, a couple weeks ago. Um, and that's really part of looking at um, what Ohio is calling the um, Access Ohio 2040 plan or 
what do we want that 33 corridor from a transportation perspective to look like in 2040? And it just, it just, there's so much happening, yeah. whether that's Hyperloop, whether that's the, the, the Smart 33 corridor or this. Uh, the uh, group that was assembled from um, um, certainly the Dublin area as well as Union um, um, County, and I'm having a blank here, help me. Um, Logan County, thank you. Um, uh, it was a really good representation of electeds, of um, staff, of businesses to really plan that together. So I think it's going to be a great group, and we'll keep you updated. But the, the kickoff was, was really something. And we saw some numbers about growth in population and employment um, from the Morpsey discussion tonight. And those numbers in Logan County and in Union County are, I mean, they reflect that same growth or even more. And the roadways are already over capacity. So I think it's, it's work um, that's going to be great. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to work with the colleagues on that. And I'll keep you guys updated. Good project. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Does that include already Northwest 33 Quarter Group? Yeah. Or you did it? Okay. We meet uh, next week. Okay. Delmar Arts Council, John. As a follow up to the uh, Field of Corn anniversary, um, Dublin Arts on October the 12th will feature Flow and Arts and Wellness Discovery um, Initiative and it'll run from 11 till 3 and yours truly will be giving a lecture on I've been drafted to lecture is going to be titled how not to die yet and how to juice so <laughs> yeah. we'll see I don't know if you want to point out the t-shirts here Councilmember Reiner and yeah that, are that was really nice this was uh, Really well executed shirt that uh, first the anniversary date is on the front. Very artistic, well done. And then, of course, the fields of corn on a diagonal. Very well done. So, thank you. Thanks to the Arts Council. That was very nice of them. Is that it, it, John? That's it. All right, thanks. Uh, Dumb Board of Education, Christina? No, nothing. Nothing. Our friends, Chief Alec. Mr. Richter, you got anything for Washington Township? Nothing at all, huh? Okay. Uh, what? Yeah, keep up the good work. <laughs> uh, Dublin Bridges, Jane. Um, the only thing, uh, I know that we may have mentioned this, I have been away for a couple weeks, but um, uh, Jill Cranstuber and Sarah Savage, it may have been mentioned at the last uh, meeting, but in case it wasn't, wanted to mention that they were inducted in the Dublin City Schools Hall of Fame last month, and they so deserve that. Um, they have done an amazing job of pulling together kindness in this community. They just finished, Dublin Bridges just finished collecting Halloween costumes for elementary students who did not, who may come to school without one. So everybody will have a Halloween costume, no fear about that. You will be spooked. Um, and I just want to remind uh, anybody who watches, I'm sure there are two or three people in the city here that watch the show, but um, if you want to sign up, if subscribe, to be a Dublin Bridges uh, resident who's interested in passing on kindness, go to www.neighborhoodbridges slash community slash Dublin, and you will be able to participate and pay forward, give a little more kindness around here. So. That's my. As I understand it, you're lucky if you get on and find needs, they get filled. That's right. Back. They get filled in 10 minutes, so you better hurry up and Let's keep and, that and there's a, one other thing. Um, um, I do this, and I'm encouraging every other council member to do this. But you can have an ongoing little donation. You can give monthly, which will go into the pantries at the um, at the schools to make sure that there is not a student in our school that ever goes without any personal care item or any need they may have, and it's just an easy way to give. So. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. We'll just stick right with you with round table. Um, no, I was on vacation, so I have nothing new nothing. to say. Okay. <laughs> Kathy? Uh, thank you. My congratulations to Michelle as well. Um, she and I were out at the Field of Corn celebration. I got to, to spend a little time there and walk around with um, Malcolm as he really discussed how they planned the field, um, what his hopes were. Um, some of the pushback from, from um, early viewers of that, the France farm and et cetera. So it was just really a, a wonderful event. And it was so fun to watch the kids hug the corn. I mean, it was just really wonderful. So it was really great. And I congratulate everybody. It was really nice. Congrats also to the Grizel Middle School for their 25th anniversary. Uh, I've had the chance to attend a few of the anniversaries from the school because we're, we're all 
turning 25 or 30. Um, they did a fantastic job. Congratulations to Principal Evans. They had food trucks and sporting events and all sorts of stuff. So it was really quite a celebration. So that was wonderful. Um, I had just a couple questions about some of the information stuff in the packet. Um, the roundabout statistics, thanks for the update on that. There was a, a memo there that talked about with the enhancements that have been made and the changes, the absolute improvements to the safety on that. That is great. Um, there was a comment at the end of the, looking at for some more continuing, continued improvements. So don't, don't, I'm looking for an answer now, but if you could share with us a little bit what some of those continuous improvements are. I get asked by that for, for residents. Um, so I think it's it's great to see that we've 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 made a huge in, in improvement, and what are some of the things that that we're doing? So I think that would be um, wonderful to share. And the other, um, I know we had asked for sort of an inventory of the private streets in there, and I think in that memo it talked very nicely about those that had converted. I didn't see, maybe I missed it. Was there an inventory of 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 all the private streets? Was that in there, and I just didn't see it? It was in there. Okay, I'll go back and look at that. There is, there was a slide in them. Uh, there was a lot of things. I'll go back and look at it. But that that will show all the private streets in the city, and and roughly how many are are. There are only seven streets. Ah, uh, so maybe we're looking for the drives because I expect. Yeah, I only saw those few, and I thought, huh. Oh. So okay, any guesstimate on the number of drives? A lot. Okay, so maybe some of the more major ones. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Just again, congratulations to Michelle. And it's interesting how um, Dublin's sort of the cradle of, um, I think, great civic, civic leaders. And uh, it's a compliment to you, the staff, and our leadership that uh, we raise up people to such excellence that everybody else wants to come over here and poach our people. So the rest of you sitting in the audience that belongs to us, we would like you to stay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, John. Michael? Uh, congratulations, Michelle. So if you, I sent you a note. If you need any history, I moved there in 1952. So I've got the old, all the old stuff, yeah. Thanks, Mike. Christina? Thanks. Um, I'll add my congratulations. I emailed you separately. Um, over the weekend, I had an opportunity and the honor to attend the 150th anniversary of Gandhi's birth. Um, through the Gandhi Memorial Society, and they had an essay contest uh, around Gandhi's message of nonviolence and love in, in, in public discourse, and how is that relevant in today's society. And so there were, um, I think they had somewhere around 100, 100 essays submitted, and there were two essays from each of the high schools that were selected as, as the finalists, and then there was one grand prize winner, which was $1,000. So that was a great honor. Congratulations to all the essay winners, um, and thanks again for allowing me to attend. It was really fun. They had dance and song and um, lots of really wonderful folks, uh, very welcoming folks. So I really enjoyed it and really appreciate it. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Christina. Chris? Yeah, um, I've attended several HOA meetings around town in the last couple months. Uh, one of them had brought forward a couple questions. Um, but also our staff, John, uh, with Code Enforcement, has done a really great job of representing the city there. Um, I'll have a couple questions I'll reach out to, um, probably to you, Megan, separately. But there were some questions regarding the fallen uh, timbers roundabout and um, the post road pedestrian crossing. So I will reach out to you on that separately. Um, and also for code enforcement for the vacant land there by Corbin's Mill. So there's a lot of concerns about that. Um, I, too, got to attend uh, the um, post office celebration of Gandhi's 150th birthday. Uh, with the commemorative uh, postmark cancellation stamp. So uh, that was a really great morning. And there were people there from all over the place. They're uh, recovering it from New York. And so I, I, I suspect we were one of the very few that had the opportunity to do that. So that was quite nice. And I told the third grade at Deer Run that I would give them a shout out. I got to visit them this week. And they had wonderful questions about all things relative to city government. Uh, in your packet, uh, was an information only item on uh, our trip to Japan uh, and highlighted some of the events there. I won't delay our time by going over all those, but certainly happy to have any conversations uh, celebrated by um, our time there and uh, with people like Denzo. And uh, it was funny to go halfway across the world and see some people from home, but uh, it was certainly a, a really good trip, a privilege to be there. And um, 
you know, anytime you get to spend that much time with the governor and talk about what's going on in your city and what your concerns are is certainly an opportunity that you don't want to miss. So uh, thank you for that opportunity. And that's all I have. Thanks, Chris. I just want to uh, thank David Guillaume and the, the Arts Council. If you think about everything that they do in our community, if you picked up every thing that they touched and took it out of Dublin, it would just be so sorely missed. And you just don't even, um, I don't know that we appreciate it enough every single day. And, and I, I got my little Field of Corn t-shirt here, John. And so thanks to David and everything he does. And what you do, John, I know you've been a tireless supporter of the Arts Council for many, many years. And they add such a richness to our community. So it's really a fantastic thing. And Michelle, um, we wish you the best. I know you're going to do a fantastic job for who you're there going to. Welcome you with open arms. I'm sure you're going to exceed every expectation that they have. We will miss you very much, but you will be here for a couple of more months yet. So we will, uh, again, have the opportunity to wish you the best as that day approaches. But um, they're very, very fortunate. They could not have made a better selection. And with that, we are adjourned.